So we are here in Derek Mitzvah Sechel, the Mitzvah of Tegalachas Mitzvah, <coughs> Hebrew English edition, page 151. <coughs> He's explaining why both things are necessary. On one hand, we judge Rosh Hashanah, and we judge for everything that's going to happen throughout the year. And in Rosh Hashanah, everything is designated what's going to happen throughout the year. <clears throat> how much panos a person will get, how much help a person will get. And then we say that every single day a person is judged whether they should get it or not. The question was, what is the, what is the reason for both judgments? <clears throat> and the answer is that the judgment of the Rosh Hashanah is, that, first of all, a good morning, a general judgment. The judgment of how much highest will be drawn into the world this year. And that highest as general includes everything, all the details of all the spiritual worlds, the physical world, and every single creation and every single detail in these worlds. <clears throat> and then that happens on Rosh Hashanah. And then Yom Kippur then things get broken down to details. That this was broken down to this world, and that's to another world, and this is to, to these uh, creations, and this is to other creations, this is angels, humans, animals, neshamas, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so, Hasima, the reason why it's called Hasima is because something is sealed, it means that's it, it's finished. In other words, as long as the Chayas hasn't been distributed yet to any details, it can go anywhere, any place. But once the Chayas is distributed into details, then it's already now formed in a way that it's going to only be applied to Atzilus, not to Bria, to Bria, not to Yitzhira, to angels, not to Neshamas, to this Neshama, not to another Neshama. Everything is already measured and cut to size, so to speak. And once it's cut to size, yeah, think of it, think of it as a piece of material. Before you do anything with material, you can cut it to any size. But once you go to the tailor and they cut it to size, they say, oh, excuse me, could you make it a little bit longer? I'm sorry, too late. I already cut it down to size. Okay. So <laughs> it happens all the time, right? Yeah. So the, the highest, the light force that Hashem sends on Rosh Hashanah gets cut down to size, meaning it fits everything in the world according to its size. Once that's done, then the Chayra, there's no changing that can be changed. That's why it's called sealed. The second thing is, even if it's designated, that for example, for this person, what's meant to happen to him, he's supposed to get X amount of Chesed, but the Chesed that, he, that was given to him First is given to him in the world of Atsilas, then to the world of Bria, then to the world of Yitzira. The way it is in the spiritual world, it's chesed. And his neshama receives that chesed. But that chesed is all in a spiritual form, which means I can't put bread on my table from that chesed. If that chesed doesn't manifest into physical bread, then I won't have what to eat. So what's the chesed? The chesed is something in the spiritual realm. Let's say when we say when a person is given a reward that after 120, when the shaman goes to Gan Eden, he gets tremendous reward. What kind of reward is that? It's a spiritual reward. Spiritual things are happening. Spiritual things is not going to help me down here. <clears throat> Okay, 
So how, it, how what has to happen? That chesed has to evolve and evolve and evolve and evolve. Every time it continues to evolve, it gets closer to the world of Gashmias, to the world of form, to the world of finite, until eventually it evolves into food, into clothing, into money, into all the brachas we need in this physical world. So therefore, let's take a scenario. It's Rosh Hashanah. And the Eberster designated Shemayim that this and this person will earn, um, this and this week, he'll earn $5,000. That's going to happen to him this and this week. So the, the, the light of Hashem, of Chesed, which is going to be the source of the $5,000, that was released on Rosh Hashanah, right? And then from Rosh Hashanah on, it starts a journey. Every day that goes by, it's going down lower and lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. And lower. So depending on when it's supposed to happen, if it was designated that this person is going to have $5,000, somehow it's going to be delivered to him, and the day is going to be Chav Hei Cheshman Tov Shem this year. So it was designated on Rosh Hashanah, which is about two months ago, and it's when it's going to come down is on Chav Hei Cheshman today. So from here, from all this time, from Rosh Hashanah, it's journeying from here, transforming. And finally, on the 25th of Cheshman, it goes from here to here, and that chesed energy turns into $5,000. So therefore, on Rosh Hashanah, we daven for the general chesed. Why do we daven every day? Because there's another judgment. Even though it was judged that I'm going to get $5,000, but on this day, there's another judgment. Should he actually get it or not? What does that mean? Should the chesed, he got the chesed already. It's in his possession. But should it remain in the spiritual? Or now the question is, should it come down to the next level, which is physical? And that's why we daven, Hashem, give me parnasa. And of course, I daven today, or I did mitzvah today, I give tzedakah today then that chesed will evolve into that, come down to this world. <clears throat> Let's say the words inside. Yes. So, still like the beginning of what you said is still true of the allotments already where each bracha is going to on the Shana. That's not for money, that's not for Right. Generally not, but of course, through three well, certain things, a very unusual circumstance, we could change it. He's going to talk about that a little bit later in the mind. We'll get there soon. Let's tap on the page 151. In regards to this, our sages say, person is judged every day, which means Every day there's another judgment. But this judgment is not whether he's going to get chesed. He got it already. Whether it's justifiable and fitting that this chesed, which was already designated to the person on Yom Kippur, should be drawn down into material benefits. If he deserves, that he deserves, that means this light of chesed, which is a spiritual light, should descend until it will come down to this physical world and turn into food or clothing or parnasa or whatever it is. And in heaven, in the heavenly court, they're judging, means they look into his actions if he still deserves it. It won't be taken away from him, but it just won't descend to the next level. And if he doesn't deserve it, it won't be taken away, but it will remain in the spiritual realm. And as a result of that, he'll have a lot of tremendous spiritual benefit in the spiritual world. And that's why we daven and we say, Hashem, I'm asking you, please bring down this chesed to me in the physical world in those things that I need here. And that's why we're asking, Rafa'enu, Hashem, please make me healthy. 
please give me panasa, the field should give produce. The Tzayin Elayma, what are we asking? Sheyum sheikh min chesed hanau, that this chesed, which you already designated for me, and it's already drawn to me, that chesed, teiv gashmi beilam hazeh, it should manifest in goodness and kindness in this physical world, in the physical form. Mashadam tzarech, what a person needs. It shouldn't remain lemaila in a spiritual way. Because if it does remain in a spiritual way, it won't have the good in this physical world. That he won't have. Yeah. Um, if it, or when it comes down physically in this world, um, does the person have like the physical benefits and the spiritual benefits? Or like the second it comes down here, like they left them spiritually? Like it's... Obviously, we want it physically, but it also sounds good. It says it says spiritual will appear to him in the subway, so like we also want that. So, whenever our cake and eat it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, also, everything physically is connected spiritually. So, like, once he has it down here and it's still, it's still has a source in the spiritual realm, like, what happens in the spiritual? So, remember, we said that one of the difference between Gashmis and Ruchnis. In Gashmi, when you say one thing, let's say a seed becomes a tree, the seed is no longer here. Spiritually, when we talk about things evolving, all the levels could be there at the same time. So, yes, it could be that if a person gets that bracha, the chesed, it does exist on all levels, even after it comes down to Gashmi, it still exists on all levels. <clears throat> so this is a story the Rebbe told more than once. And the stories with the Rebbe Rashab, that a chassid went into the Rebbe Rashab, and he asked for something. It seems it was something about a person who was sick, and it was a matter of life or God forbid the opposite. And the Rebbe Rashab said, "I can't help you." He walked out of the Rebbe's room and just broke down crying. The Rebbe Rashab had a brother. He was an older brother. His name is Reb Zalman Arum. He was called by a an acronym, Raza, because it's a machzah that called all his grandchildren by this by their acronym, like Rashab, Raza. Everyone had a title like that. <clears throat> so he was older than the Rabbi Rashab, and that's why the Rabbi Rashab didn't want to accept leadership. He kept telling everyone to go to my youngest brother, and the younger brother said, Go to my older brother. <clears throat> Good morning, Leah. Oh, no, just the morning started earlier today. <laughs> So he walked over to him and he asked him why he's crying. It took a while to even calm him down that he could even speak. And he said, he was just by the Rebbe and he told him, I can't help you. So he said, wait a second, wait here. He went into the Rebbe's room and he said to him, how could you do this? Is he, a Yid went into you, asked you for something which is touches him to the core of his neshama. He's crying out there. How could you say you're not going to help him? You have to help him. So the Rebbe Shab said, okay, tell him to come in again. He went the second time, he gave him a bracha, and everything was fine. Every time the Rebbe would tell the story, every time the Rebbe would choke up, that couldn't even talk. And the Rebbe has a simple question. If the Rebbe Rashab was able to help him, he would have done it the first time. He didn't do the first time because he couldn't. So what difference did it make that his brother came in and said, no, it's not nice. I mean, if he can't, he can't. If he could, he could. He would have done it before. <clears throat> so the Rebbe said that Abba, the Rebbe Rashab saw that this person has a bracha, but the bracha is up there. It, it, it's not manifesting. Something was going on that was blocking the bracha from manifesting the gashmas. When he went out and he broke down crying, that crying, which was a form of tshuva, broke whatever was blocking. And now he's able to come in. There's one part which I don't remember clearly, whether the Rebbe said it or not, but uh, that, in fact, the reason why he told him in the first place something so harsh, I can't help you, was in order to bring him to tears, which he knew would break the blockage and then allow the bracha to come down. You know, you're not allowed to make a person cry. What if you know that making the person cry is not going to save your life? Then it's a, and also it's a crying of tshuva. It's not just crying. 
don't know if you know the story with the Rambam. The Rambam was also a doctor, you know, a very big doctor. And in the same time of the Rambam lived another one of the commentators on the Torah called Eben Ezra. And he traveled to the Rambam because he had a problem with his eyesight, something with his vision. So he knocked at the door and he asked if he could see the Rambam. He has a health problem. And the Rambam said, before you see me tonight, I want you to spend the night in the barn with the goats. What a strange uh, answer. It was very humiliating. But anyway, he went into the barn with the goats. The Rambam said to do that. And he was crying the whole night because he felt that he's being rejected, that something's wrong, he's spiritually not ready, that the Rambam should, should meet with him. Came back the next day. <clears throat> and whatever condition he had was cured. So the Rambam said, the only cure for this condition is tears. I don't know what the condition was. I know there is something today called dry eyes, where people see blurry and all sorts of things wrong. Uh, they can't, uh, it's not clear because their eyes are dry. They don't, the eyes doesn't produce enough tears. I don't know if it's related to that, but apparently it was a condition that the eye didn't produce enough tears. And tears are something which, which heal this condition of the eye. But this is different. This is also a crying of tshuva. Maybe that was also a crying of tshuva. But he also gave no physical reason, a medical reason, that the tears is what helped him. And obviously, if we tell him cry, it wouldn't help. So he did something to make him cry. But anyway, that's what it means. The bracha is right here. It's hanging. It's it's hovering over, but spiritually. And the Reverend Hashab needed to do something to break whatever was blocking it from coming down, being the gashmas. And now we can reconcile both of these quotes. When our sages say, on one hand, everything is allotted between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. Yes, it's true. On Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, there's a certain amount of chesed that's drawn down to his soul. This chesed Many different kinds of good things could come as a result of the chesed. The Tevis Elam has it here in the physical world. And that's what it means. The other Maimachazal, other Nidim Machal Yayim, person is judged. That's why davening is always beneficial, even though it would say, What's the point? I was already decided in Rosh Hashanah. No, this is for a different reason. Now we're davening so that whatever good was decided should come down. By the way, it also works in the reverse. <clears throat> the chas v'shalom, the opposite happens, which means that there's a decree in Shemayim of something negative happening. So that means in Shemayim, they release the energy of Gevura. And that's supposed to evolve into something which is going to be a negative thing, a person can have a loss of money, chas v'shalom, a loss of health. So once it's designated in Rosh Hashanah, if there's nothing I can do about it, why are we diving every day? I should be healthy. And if it was designated, and if it's not designated in Rosh Hashanah, and if it, and being that it was, what what? and if I am diving every day, then why do we need to do it on Rosh Hashanah if we're judged every day? So the answer is, even if a person was judged, and Chas Shalom and Rosh Hashanah was designated that something negative would happen. Nevertheless, when I dive in this day, I could prevent it from coming down from the spiritual to the physical, and therefore it will never affect me. <clears throat> so probably there's a certain avoid or a certain mitzvah that can uproot it completely. But generally, through Tefillah, what I can do is I could stop it. But we could also up good. We don't want to uproot, but the negative we we could probably search certain schus and certain merits. We can uproot that it shouldn't be there at all. This is what it says. Also, one of the reasons why we have to be careful and not to bring out of our mouth only brachas, not to bring out of our mouth the opposite, because sometimes you think to yourself, "What's it? What? What is the big deal? I say this. I'm nobody. I'm not a tzaddik. I'm a regular person." 
But if Chas Vashon, there's something negative that's uh, sort of hovering over, it never came to the physical. By me pronouncing it, I could cause it to come down from the spiritual to the physical. So, they have, and the same with the bracha. That's why brachas help. We know a bracha but tzaddik is amazing. But the truth is, the Gemara says anybody's bracha could really be affected. There's <clears throat> a famous quote in Gemara, Altia Birchat Kal. No, Altia Birchat Hedyut Kal Beinecha. Don't take lightly the bracha of an ordinary person. Because any person sometimes could be the right moment, the right situation. They give you a bracha, and that could bring that could bring the results. I remember a few years ago, somebody, what? Is it true that when someone is giving you a blessing, you need to like do something in return, for example, to give a coin to the dog, like meaning, so it's going to be exchanged? Or you could just say, thank you, I'm good. I mean, I just, someone told me, but I, but <laughs> someone gave me a blessing, and then he's like, well, you want to give that stuff? Because he was, I think he was collecting stuff I gave him, but I, I, he said for sure that every time someone is giving you a you need to at home, for example, to put a coin in your tzedakah box. Well, you see that after we say tilim, we give out tzedakah. What is that based on? The Rebbe once said, whenever you say tilim for somebody, <clears throat> you give tzedakah. And I think the purpose of tzedakah is related to that. Now that I'm taking a physical coin, putting it into tzedakah, that enhances the process that the ruch music of bracha should come down by gashmas. So it could make sense, even with the person. If the person gives you a bracha, he just says, you say, Amen, you say, thank you. But by doing, in addition to that, a mitzvah like tzedakah, it sort of uh, expedites, the pro- makes it faster, the process that it should go from spiritual to physical. Okay. So there's a story that I think I told you when we were doing Rosh Hashanah, I'll get to you in a second. But in the Gemara, there's like a long list of stories all along the same lines and one of the famous stories is Rabbi Kiva's daughter, I think I told the Rosh Hashanah, that she was getting married, and the stargazer said that he sees it's the last day in her life, and then they saw that, no, she was alive, and he has to check her house, and he found that there was a dead snake, a poisonous snake, and it was killed by her, by mis- not knowingly. She had a pin that she stuck into the wall, and she didn't realize it was at night that she stuck it into the snake's head and Killed it. So her father asked her, what did you do? And she said that she did an act of tzedakah at the night of her wedding. And her father, Rabbi Kiva, said, that is what saved your life. So if you think of it, that means there was a decree in Shemaim and Rosh Hashanah that this should happen. And the decree already touched the physical world because the snake was already moving. And it went to her home and was already in her house and in her room. But the last minute, there was another judgment. Should it actually happen? And then the merit of her giving tzedakah came, and in that merit, it was judged that it shouldn't happen by Gashmas. Or, like like uh, like Shuli says, or oh, maybe it got uprooted the ruchnis. We don't know. Now we don't know. This is the reason why the Rebbe, by the way, did that. Like the Rebbe explained was why he gives out dollars. People don't even, some people don't even know what he means, he gives out dollars. He gives out brachas, he gives out dollars. The Rebbe is giving brachas. When people walked over to the Rebbe, every person, the Rebbe would tell them, bracha v'atzlacha. Certain people, they asked questions, the Rebbe gave them answers, but whoever came, the Rebbe gave them a dollar. The Rebbe wants to explain that the purpose of it is when you're giving a dollar, the bracha is connected to something, to a physical object that also helps the process that the bracha that you just got should come down to the physical level. Remember we explained Rosh Hashanah, that's why we dip the challah into honey, and mm-hmm. why we eat a sweet apple, it's physical sweetness. All these are like anchors to draw the bracha down to the physical level. What? Wait, so you want to ask the question before? Yeah. <clears throat> So we can, I know that we can give Sadaka to elevate someone's soul who has passed. Can we give Sadaka for someone who like needs a bracha brought down in this physical world, like on behalf of another person? Sure, of course. Like, does it have any different weight to them doing it? 
it's it's I mean, of course, the biggest brach is when the person does things for himself. But when we do something for another person, it's also effective. And maybe, you know, maybe the fact that not only the tzedakah, but the fact <laughs> that Hashem sees how one yid cares for another yid, that's an additional factor that has more merit. Yeah. So here it says Gimel, if you notice. It's not so conspicuous. Which means we just finished the second, the second uh, chapter in this Maimir. So therefore, I would want to go to the review to the workbook and do the questions on the second chapter. So the question in the second chapter. Um, Page fifty one, no, page fifty two, right? It's a fifty three. Fifty three. Okay. Well, the phrases and terms are in fifty two. What? My phrases and terms are in fifty two. Fifty two. Yeah, that's yeah. a. We're starting with the terms. Yeah. No, let's go. You want to go with the questions first, right? So I think after this, we did it so many times, and the questions and answers are obvious. But let's read it inside, just if you want to write down for yourself to remember. What is the difference between the chesed drawn down the Rosh Hashanah, uh, which I just said now a minute ago, so we don't have to repeat it, and the chasima, the sealing on Yom Kippur? Which of the above is accomplished by Hey Chasadim, and which is by Hey Gevuris? It said that in the Mimer, even though I didn't elaborate on it. So the Hey Gevuris is the one that breaks things down into details. Hey Chasadim is the general light of Hashem, which is not broken down to details, and that comes on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. What, what? In the second question, right? I guess just like on the hand, there's five fingers on the right hand. That would be the five chasadim. There's five fingers on the left hand. That's five gvura. So which of the two things we just said there's two things, one that happens on Rosh Hashanah and one that happens every day of the year. No, no, Rosh Hashanah, one that happens on Yom Kippur, when things get sealed. So I'm asking which is the five chasadim and which is the five gevuras. So five Rosh Hashanah is the five chasadim, because then things are in a general way, not so broken up into details. And Yom Kippur, when it gets sealed, that means it gets broken down to details. When it gets broken down to details, that's gevuras. Sorry, what does Hasima mean? Hasima means sealing. Oh, what we say, Kasima <laughs> the Hasima Teva. <laughs> now I know what I'm saying. Why must the chesed from Atzilus go through so many heichalas? Heichalas means chambers, and so many changes until it reaches us. <laughs> right? Because it's ruchnius, it's spiritual, it's abstract, and it can't affect us here in this physical world. I mean, it's like saying, somebody's going to say, what you just had now said, that was really a very sharp statement. Could you cut a piece of paper with it? <laughs> no, it's sharp, but not in a physical sense. Um, what are the yeah. The chambers. I thought the chambers is like problems. Chambers is something different. It's not the spheres. I know. That's what it's called Hey Chavos. I know. I thought that's the love. Not really. In other words, just like Begashmi is what's a chamber? A chamber is where the person is. So the, the Shemayim in the spiritual realm is also sort of a place where the spheres are. That's called Hechavis. When the Shamas are, Malachim are, it's their apartments where they live, you know. <laughs> Whatever. It's a muscle. Okay, number four, how do we reconcile the two Maimari Azal? Persons judge every day 
and the other one that everything is determined on Rosh Hashanah. So the answer is the general judgment is on Rosh Hashanah. And the everyday judgment is whether the chesed that was already allotted on Rosh Hashanah should it manifest in the physical realm. And again, number five, what is the purpose of davening every day if everything has been determined on Rosh Hashanah? And the answer is for this reason. So I guess if you write down the answer to any of these questions, you have the whole chapter. And that's the main point of this ois, is to explain this question. The main point of this ois is number four. How do we reconcile the two Maimon and Chazal that a person is judged every day and at the same time, everything is determined in Rosh Hashanah. Now, let's go back to page 52. So, hey, Gavur, as we just explained, I just want to remind you, we went through it last time, that we see this hey, Gavur, is manifest in a few different places. Number one, the fingers on the hand. Remember, we explained that if a person would have, if Hashem would create humans with a hand, but not fingers, we'd be able to make movement, but all the detailed movement would be impossible. So, that means that the fingers, they break down the movements to detail. In art, in writing letters, everything is because of the fingers. The other example is the five metzores apet, the five parts of the mouth. Also, they break down the voice. And that's what allows different letters to come out. Another third example is the five letters in the alpha base that are called final letters. Their function is to bring the world, the word, to an end. Olamet doesn't mean it's the end. Zayin doesn't mean it's an end, but it's a final mem, final chaf, final nun, final fe, final tzaddik. That means it's ending. That's gavura. So here too, we have five such letters that they end in. So that's that's called the hey gavuras. <laughs> The five? Yeah. I know there's an acronym. You tell me the five final letters? Oh, Mansapath. Yeah. Mansapath. Mem, Nun, Man, Tzadik, Pe, Ches. No, Chok. Tzadik, Pe, Chok. So Nasira, number three, number four, let's skip it because that's not one of the things that are so common. But number five and number six is common. Highest Chloe, highest Preti. How would you translate that? General life source. Right. There's a general life source and there's also a specific life force, which is each each detail gets a different kind of light. Like number seven. Where it says that the letters are arranged differently, that's called Tsirufe Oisius, the way you combine the letters. So you have the same letters, for example, but the way you combine the letters could bring different creations. Tomorrow's Oisius means exchanging the letters. So instead of this letter, there's another letter because these two letters come from the same part of the mouth. That's as an example. Chavbeis Asius, twenty-two letters, that is referring to the alphabets, because even though there's altogether twenty-nine, that's because of five final letters. But this, this, even the final letters are still the same basic letters: mem, nun, tzaddik, pei, chav. Chasima is the ceiling. Hello, Mamish Hashiva. I don't remember where we have those words in here, but it means that's considered like nothing. It's insignificant. Islapshus. Well, the bush means a garment. Islapshus is more like a verb to, to get dressed in a garment, to get invested in something lower, invested in a garment. We use the term slapshus. And a cholas are the chambers. Okay. So 
We have a few minutes. We'll start Gimel. That's page 153. <clears throat> now he's bringing it down, Mamish, to the bottom line, how is it practical, applied to a person in the business world. Now we can understand in a very, and really appreciate and enjoy the reason. We all know that if you want Parnasa, it's not enough to trust in Hashem, but you also need to do the work. You have to buy, you have to sell, you have to work in a job, you have to do things to make it happen. And the question is why? Even though it's all from Hashem. And if Hashem wants me to make this money, then I'll make it. If He doesn't want me to, I can do everything better than anyone else in this field, and I won't make the money because He doesn't want me to. So it's all Hashem anyway. The reason is, even if a person is judged every day, good, that he'll have parnasa, she'ilei parnasa, according to Torah, if he won't involve himself with doing business, he's saying doing business, but it does not mean business, means working, he won't have anything. Like Rabbi Shmuel said, Hanik ben minik you have to follow the ways of the world. And he's talking about tzaddikim. And some tzaddikim, like Rav Shem they chose to be learning all day, davening, and not to spend time for Panasa. And he says, even Rav Shem that did live that way, Rav Shem said, he doesn't agree with Rabbi Shmuel. You don't have to follow the ways of the world. It's because he said, how are you going to, what's going to happen with the Torah? Well, who's going to study Torah? Even according to him, somebody already acquired the vast knowledge of Torah, then he has an obligation to learn Torah. And, and nevertheless, he still has to go out and do Parnasa. Stop learning and go do Parnasa. We find in Gemara, Tanoim. Tanoim, these are the people that the whole Gemara is based on their teachings. One was a woodchopper, one was this, one was that. They all had, a lot of them had other gash musical things that they did. So of course we know the rule, Hashem wants things to go through the gash music, but based on this mime, we'll have a new appreciation of why it's necessary. And even though there's so many sikhs, but it's never, this is the source, where all the sikhs sort of bring it from here. And and also here it's explained in a certain way. After learning what we learned before, you'll understand it better. To be continuous, you have to come tomorrow so you'll be able to have the follow. -up. Okay. Thank you. Okay, כל יום, כי גם אם נפלנו, נחתם בראש השנה, אם אנחנו מתפללים, כל יום, כן, כל יום, 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 כ